what we try to do is to give uh, education to primary care role to, in order to translate this into patient care. Um, the things that um, primary care uh, need to know is that to recognize the disease itself and to make the counseling and education the patient needs and to refer this to a hepatologist when indicated because obviously with such a huge amount of patients with this disease um, it needs a lot of system approach, not just a hepatologist. And, and, and to be honest, hepatologist input at this point is still limited into what we can offer to the patient. So this is the first, uh, I think this is a very important slide to recognize the natural history of disease and just to line into how this disease is actually two, not one. The first one is if you take, if you take 100 patients with NAFO, they have fatty liver, the chances that those patients will develop an actual liver disease, meaning uh, cirrhosis and then decompensation of the cirrhosis and then liver-related death and or transplant, you are taking from all those hundred about one or two. So in terms of a liver disease where a hepatologist needs to be involved, this is a very, very small part. So when I see a patient with NAFO, it's the chances that this patient is going to end up needing liver transplant is very, very small. However, because we have huge number of these patients uh, nationwide and now worldwide, this 1-2% might mount to 2-3 two, 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 million patients needing the transplant as a projection. Now the rest of the patient, they only have uh, uh, fatty liver, they might never develop cirrhosis, or they might just develop cirrhosis that's compensated without, without complications. And those are the bulk of the population with mantle, and that's where this has its own impact and we try to understand this. So when we understand, when we when I recognize the risk factors for the disease, obviously obesity is uh, number one risk factor. But here I just put under it that there are examples of this disease existing in, in lean or non-obese patients. It's called lean non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's about seven percent of the uh, of, uh, of of patients uh, of of adult have lean body, and it is this in this situation it's more frequent. In female, younger age, with normal liver enzymes, but nevertheless, they can progress liver disease over time. And in terms of ethnicity, this lean NAFL is noticed among uh, Asian ethnic patients more than other ethnicities. And metabolic syndrome, these are the criteria for metabolic syndrome. And obviously, each one of them is by itself is a risk factor for non alcoholic and here, this is a chronological development of feature of metabolic syndrome. Uh, it doesn't count uh, the fatty liver as part of the chronological order. It puts weight gain first, and then the lipid changes, and then comes the hypertrophic That's the liver, uh, liver enzyme abnormality, and then the, uh, the hyperglycemia or the blood sugar elevation. But I would expect because many of NAFL has normal liver function tests, the, the fatty liver itself comes way earlier. Now, this is where the disease is important for this conference, for the approach of obesity in general, is that, is this NAFL by itself a contribution <coughs> to metabolic syndrome? Because we always think of obesity and metabolic syndrome as a risk factor for NAFL, but does NAFL itself make things worse for metabolic syndrome and obesity? And the evidence show that NAFL is actually not just an innocent bystander. It has actually an impact. And here, there is a lot of studies, a lot of Therefore, there was just that uh, in Washington uh, for updates about this disease, there's a lot of research to show this interaction between NAFL and the risk of components of metabolic syndrome. And I will just put a few slides that I saw interesting to just emphasize this point. So, what is, for example, when you look at the outcomes, the uh, adverse outcome, if you have no NAFL and, uh, and no metabolic syndrome, you are the least to have adverse outcome. But if you have NAFL, you start to have some adverse outcome. If you add metabolic syndrome to NAFL, then you have the most amount of, of uh, bad uh, uh, adverse outcome. And here, uh, the existence of each component of the metabolic syndrome in the presence of NAFL, you can see the, the, the chances of having any one of those is higher if you have NAFL than if you don't. This is another example about the lipids. Um, uh, here, at, at, between the shaded area and the not shaded area, it just uh, divide the VLDL into the systemic, the free fatty acid versus the non-systemic that coming from the liver. And with, if you have NAFLD, then most of your serum VLDL is coming actually from the liver. So 
tells you that NAFLD might actually be producing and adding to the problem of the dyslipidemia uh, you may have. Uh, this is, uh, I was at the conference just uh, a few weeks ago and I was writing notes, so this was interesting. If you have NAFL, the more fatty liver you have, the smaller the LDL particle is, and that makes it more atherogenic. And similarly with VLDL, the more fatty liver you have, the larger the VLDL particle that, uh, that is, and that makes it more atherogenic. Just to kind of show that fatty liver is not just sitting there and just accumulating the fat, actually might make things worse for the outcome. And NAFLD and diabetes, if you have uh, patients with diabetes and NAFLD, then their glycemic control has worse, uh, it's more difficult. There's increased proliferative retinopathy, increased prevalence of cardiac and kidney disease, 2.2-fold uh, increase in all-cause mortality. But if they don't have diabetes and have NAFLD, then there's 2.5-fold risk of developing diabetes after adjustment for several lifestyle and metabolic compatibility. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, this is a nice uh, slide just to to show how nice it is that we have cap. This is uh, to measure the fatty liver index. So obviously this is not your ultrasound way of finding uh, defining fatty liver. It's either histology or using the proton uh, density fat fraction and showing the more fatty liver index you have, the uh, it predicts that your development of that type two diabetes is higher. So it puts you at higher risk of diabetes. And if I want to predict now that we have cap, we might be able to use this number because we can get a number that maybe we can say, okay, now you are, you are, you, if you don't have diabetes, you are this close to be. This is also just in press, it's in 2000, it is very fresh, and it was just in, the, in the conference, they talked about how la liver fat can be used as a barometer for adipose insulin resistance. So it's another way of how fatty liver itself as a, as a public problem can be contributing and maybe, maybe predicting the uh, uh, metabolic syndrome complications. There's some, some extra hepatic manifestation of NAFL, chronic kidney disease with ultrasound defined carries a 1.5 to 2 fold risk of incidence. Overt and subclinical hypothyroidism are both associated with NAFL and independent of known metabolic risk factors. Osteoporotic fractures in male patients. Uh, actually also increase in natural patients. Polycystic ovarian system syndrome uh, prevalence among female patients is higher among natural patients. That's from Australia, the study. Sorry. Natural and uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, there's no data to kind of make this correlation, but the consensus is to identify cardiovascular disease in natural patients, regardless of the presence of transition risk factors, and screen for natural among patients with cardiovascular disease. So the prevalence, how common is this disease? Um, it parallels basically the pre prevalence of metabolic syndrome. In North America, 24.13% of general population is estimated to have natural, based on ultrasound or, or other radiologic modality. Among patients who receive, if you go to a special population, those who get uh, uh, weight reduction surgery, 93% of those patients have natural. If you go to diabetes uh, clinic patients, you, you get natural up to 65 to 70%. And among patients seen in the dyslipidemia clinic, about 50% have Global prevalence, um, the, uh, the highest is uh, Middle East and South America, and lowest in Africa. Um, now, I, I want to just point at this, this line here, that NAFL, based on blood testing, because this is the way we usually identify NAFL. Somebody, you do a liver function test, it's abnormal, you send him work up, and you find he has fatty liver disease. Using the serologic marker, usually underestimate the disease, because the disease you can be with normal liver function tests. And that's why the proactive approach is very important in this disease. Uh, in different ethnicity, so Hispanic ethnicity is known to have the highest rate of NAFL and its complications, NASH and liver cancer, and the African American is known to have the lowest prevalence of, of NAFL. Now this is where this is important for us here, is because according to ASMB guidelines, this is from 2012, it appears that prevalence of NAFL among American Indians and Alaska Natives is lower. However, due to lack of histologic data, this is probably an underestimate. So we don't really have an accurate number to say, uh, to, talk, to look at this disease 
into uh, American Indian and Australian and obviously, just like you mentioned, uh, uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity in children, similarly, NAFLD among children, as many as 10 to 20% of children, and 1 to 2% may have advanced <coughs> fibrosis cirrhosis, and we have seen patients in their 20s already having really bad infections. <coughs> and here, uh, fibrosis is very difficult, diet, probably the same as you would approach children with, with obesity anyway. Uh, Long term outcome. Cardiovascular disease uh, outcome is the, is the main cause of mortality in natural patient, and then followed by hepatocellular carcinoma, and then followed by liver specific mortality. But when you go to NASH, the more aggressive form, then liver related complications more common, like hepatocellular carcinoma, the liver specific, specific mortality comes higher. But cardiovascular disease is the main, most uh, number one reason for the um, the economic burden of this disease, uh, new, this is a new uh, study published recently between the U.S. and four European countries, and in the U.S. result shows that uh, about 64 million people are projected to have NAFL with annual direct medical costs of about $103 billion, about $1,613 per patient. This is just to show that although there's one or two percent chance that a NAFL patient would end up with really advanced cirrhosis, with this large number of patients that projected to have the disease, you are looking into two, three millions that will end up with such a bad outcome from the liver itself. The most important now, I'm going a little bit clinical because usually the diagnosis you get, either from blood work or from ultrasound, is that you have steatosis. But the question that really we, we need to answer here is how much scarring there is in the liver. Because that gives you an idea in which direction the patient's going. And here, just to show, if you just have fatty liver, the scarring stages, it's four stages from one to the second, it takes about 14 years if you just have fatty liver, but it becomes accelerated if you have the inflammatory aggressive form NASH for seven years, and some subtypes, rapid progressors, in 10 years, you end up with cirrhosis just from uh, NASH. <laughs> the work that, the workup, and I'm not gonna go uh, more details in the workup, I want to just say the common practice, that, and that's why we have an underestimate, is that you wait for an abnormal liver function just to do the workup. And what we're trying to do is to recommend a uh, proactive approach. That's to go after those populations that you know they are at risk. So we are collaborating with the diabetes clinic that we, at AMC, and we are planning to talk with the cardiology clinic as well. And if there is any project to kind of try to um, monitor or watch the patients with obesity, that will also be helpful to um, integrate and, and be proactive and look for the disease now that we have fiber scan. And again, I, I just repeated the same slide just to remind you that blood testing underestimates the disease. And this is one attempt from Hong Kong, this is also a recent study, to show that if you go after a certain population, it will be helpful to identify those patients. Uh, and this was done for diabetes patient. Um, it's about 2,000 patients, 1,900 to be uh, more uh, precise. And they found by just screening all the diabetic type 2 patients, 70% had increased caps of just of steatosis, and 18% showing increased liver stiffness, that's fibrosis or scarring requiring liver biopsy. So by just doing this, you identify that many patients already with advanced liver disease. And here, this is also important because we don't know about the Alaska Native and American Indian population in terms of this genetic variation. There are patients who can have NAFLD without any risk factors. And those patients can develop the liver disease itself, the fibrosis, the liver cancer, way higher and disproportionate with any other risk factors. It seems with those genetic uh, polymorphisms. Those two genes are identified with polymorphism that can cause the disease to take off. And that's where I think it's a good start to identify, make some sort of a pilot study to see if, we, if there's such a polymorphism here on the Alaska Native when we do uh, approach our study. And in those patients, you obviously worry about their liver, you do fibrosis assessment, and you, uh, but the, as of yet, family systemic screening for family member for NAFLD is not recommended yet. And next step, as I said, once you identify uh, steatosis, you go after assessment of fibrosis, and that doesn't mean liver biopsy, because we have now non-invasive, the fibroscan is namely the one we have, 
It is like an ultrasound machine and it measures the stiffness of the liver. The idea, just to refresh you up a little bit, if you got sleepy, uh, it was a hepatologist in France who, who, went, who went to go and buy some cheese. And so he went to the guy who's, who's selling cheese and he had this big, big thing of cheese. And he has this machine to make sure that the cheese is made well inside. So he thought that he would use the same idea to see if this, if, if it applies to the liver. And that's how we end up having a So, uh, and it's very handy. In many cases, liver present with normal liver function tests. And then you do this test and you find, oh, you have really high stiffness. There must be something. And then you start, oh, okay, I'm gonna spend the million dollar workup to find out what's going on because you seem to have an advanced disease versus you would, oh, everything looks good. That's where it's very, because it's this amazing. Now, once you get to the, uh, fibrosis stage being advanced, um, then you start to offer the biopsy to stage the disease and be more accurate in your assessment and maybe find uh, some other pathology that you didn't think of like hemochromatosis or Wilson disease or other things. So when do we do liver biopsy? Is when we find a fibrosis assessment that's first non invasive high, then we talk to the patient about liver, liver biopsy. And it will not change our management as of yet because we don't have a good treatment yet beside the regular recommendation. This is the treatment for NAFL. It applies to diabetes, it applies to obesity. Uh, we recommend weight loss, uh, target weight loss when we want to take to the, talk to the patient, 10% of their body weight. Uh, diet, it seems the low carb diet and Mediterranean diet are effective. Uh, exercise, aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic seems to be more effective. Um, we tell them about 12,000 steps a day as a goal. But usually only 10% of patients are able to lose 10% of their body weight. Now this is the more aggressive form. This is where you get uh, into a, a liver disease mortality. This is where hepatologists get involved. Uh, it has a distinct, uh, like a biopsy histologic findings. Um, there's a lot of kind of talk about what is, what is NASH, why it does uh, develop, and I'll try to break it down a little bit as we go. Again, uh, so once we talk about NASH, then we start to worry about this one to two percent because the, those are rapid progressors. So those are, can develop really quickly into cirrhosis, decompensation, and then liver-related mortality or, or death, death or uh, transplant. So that's where NASH become more liver disease in particular. It has its own extrahepatic manifestation, we think. Uh, since patients with NASH have been found to harbor a much higher risk of both benign and advanced colorectal lesions with odds ratio as described here. But due to falsity of well-designed studies and a true causal relationship between NASH and colorectal cancer cannot be confirmed, uh, children with NASH had lower bone mineral density than those with simple steatosis. So basically, NASH is, is just fatty liver and steroids. Everything bad you expect with, with the fatty liver is actually augmented, and on top of it, the liver disease become a target as well. Um, NASH and metabolic uh, syndrome, if you have hypertension and NASH with fibrosis, the acceleration of fibrosis in the liver be, become like twice as fast. Meaning we always think about hypertension and kidney, but if you have NASH and fibrosis, the fibrosis also happens to the liver. And ARBs and these inhibitors, which are recommended by nephrologists, are also good for NASH and NAFL and, and liver disease. For diabetes, this is a nice uh, diagram showing that the beta cell index that where the insulin is produced as the liver fibrosis stage uh, uh, progress with NASH actually decreases. So you, you are at higher risk for diabetes with low insulin. So I, I cramped this slide in, in purpose because I'm going to say we don't know. The etiology of NASH, why would somebody develop NASH this severe aggressive form is really not clear. There's all these theories and every medical center tried to put their efforts into one reason, um, but it seems the two have a really good, strong uh, ground to stand on is the microbiome in the gut and the bile acid toxicity. And those, it seems that there's a lot of good results coming out, but we're still not sure if uh, we know exactly. It might be a combination. They always blame iron, then they always do studies to show, oh, iron doesn't do anything bad. But they go back, no, it must be iron, but they, they realize that it doesn't do anything bad. Mm -hmm. um, The challenge number two is NASH is only diagnosed by liver biopsy. 
And so if somebody comes with high fibrosis and I do a, a liver biopsy and I find they have NASH, so okay, this is what you need to do. And he comes a year later and say, okay, now I did it, everything you told me, what happened now? Am I better or not? Am I gonna do another liver biopsy every time I'm gonna reassess? So this is how to monitor NASH. There's no good, even fibro scan, a cis, a cis stiffness, not the NASH, the histological the changes. So it's really challenging to, to identify NASH non-invasively yet. So there's all these efforts to try to, of course, if you have a genetic, this polymorphism, then you are in that route. You are going into NAFL, NASH, steatosis, liver cancer, and fibrosis, all that bad liver picture. But there are all these other markers they're trying to work on, like uh, there's microRNA levels in the blood and urine. There's all these studies about all these different microRNA. It is not, it doesn't carry genetic information. It has an epigenetic effect, uh, but it seems that it goes up in, in NASH. There's this measurement of cytokeratin 18. Seems to be a good marker. Um, obviously, we have fibroscan to try to use it, but doesn't really tell you much about NASH itself. And there's the MRI, which is the light fibroscan, but more expensive one. Um, and some suggest uric acid and ferritin in the blood. Some suggest other usual fibrosis by marker. That's, that we don't know. It's not really clear. Now, this is one clinical predictor of NASH. And I see, uh, from all this, I, I see can we can apply as handy and easy to apply is the persistent elevation ALT. Now, ALT and AST are not sensitive nor specific for the disease. But if you have a persistently elevated ALT and you can track them back with time, you might say, oh, you probably isn't the NASH or at risk of NASH. And uh, particularly now, we are, they are trying, our labs, I don't know how the labs see it, but our labs at AMC use 40 for ALT, 40 for ST as normal. You go other places, like in Sitka, they call 78 for ALT as, as normal. That's really high. They are now trying to say, no, for a man, it should be no more than 30. And for a woman, no more than 20 as normal. And maybe if we change those, uh, like threshold for normal, maybe we can pick up more NASH as we go because it will turn more of normal labs. You know, the challenge number three is treatment. Beyond the lifestyle that universally recommended for patients with NAFL, but if they have NASH, we don't really have much. We only have two approved, vitamin E and pyrolithazone. But look, there's all these efforts to try to find something because we know how the impact of the disease. We are expecting two to three million with this disease, so we have to come up with something. And you can, uh, I, I put it into two columns to just show the thinking behind it. Some efforts are going after how can we treat the risk factors versus how can we target the pathophysiology of the disease and try to block the disease itself from the pathophysiology. And from the uh, targeting the risk factors, the bariatric surgery is showing a great promise. And I'm almost done. Okay. The bariatric surgery seems to be really promising in treatment. They, now, there was a, a lecture I just listened to when I was in my conference suggesting that we should offer bariatric surgery to obese, not wait for morbid obesity if they have NASH, because it's, now it's becoming less and less invasive, and it has a really great effect, not just on weight reduction, but also in, on metabolism in itself. Uh, in this lipidemia, uh, the status, it's recommended, it's good for the liver, we don't recommend to stop it, but there's no randomized control study to prove it yet. The um, diabetes meditis, their glottide, Victoza, I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this, this is a new medication for diabetes, it's great for NAFL and NASH as well. And I think it's a matter of time before they show a study to, sh to become indicated for NASH, regardless if you have diabetes or not. Now, this is where the NASH become exciting, because as they are trying to understand the inflammatory, the uh, oxidant effect, the apoptosis, antifibrotic, all these mechanisms, how NASH develop, and trying to target it, they are able to get some really good result on the risk factor itself. Like, for example, the, you can see the FXR agonist is a bile acid nuclear receptor. As they are trying to target that one on the enterocyte, they are actually improving the lipid pack. The LDL is improving, HDL is improving. So it's it, that just to emphasize how the liver is not just a bystander. And as we try to target the liver, we might be able to improve the metabolism, the risk factors itself. Now, this is the last challenge. It's uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. I tried to go over it 
quickly. Usually, uh, we can predict patients at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. If they have cirrhosis, we put them on uh, monitoring six months ultrasound, and, and we just uh, to, to detect it early and be able to treat it when it is small before it's too late. Now, there is this large VA study that showed NAFL can progress into hepatocellular carcinoma before you have cirrhosis, and that's where it becomes a problem because there's such a huge number of NAFL. Who are we going to screen for for HC, for the cancer, and who we sh we don't have to? With this huge number, it is still out there. There's no guidelines. They're trying to come up with um, uh, ideas and, and way protocols, and they're still not sure. Um, there's a recent study actually showed that this is from Brian. He told me to add it. Uh, <laughs> uh, that showed that there's a group in, in the recent study that shows cancer survivor in the U.S. are improving in every almost every cancer, but for HCC, the hepatocellular carcinoma, the survival rate is dropping instead of improving. So these are risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma. You see the genetic risk is there. Metabolic syndrome components are there, and obviously we know uh, cirrhosis itself. Is now, this is just to compare hepatocellular carcinoma with, with, hepat with hepatitis C, which is another risk for cancer. Uh, it is not as high. It's just in this level, uh, square. it's about 2.5% uh, year accumulative incidence versus 4%, and 5 years is about 11% uh, versus 30. It's not as risky as hepat hepatitis C, but it is there. Um, surveillance, there is no guideline, but this is where, where it, it, it hits really hard, is that only 23% of NAFL patients, we are able to detect the hepatocellular carcinoma on surveillance. Most NAFL patients present with cancer without surveillance, meaning it is probably too late and there's, the chemotherapy is not effective. This is for the hepatocellular carcinoma, also related. Areas of interest, this is, I want to conclude with this. So, as I said, we have registry, but we don't have an established pro prospective cohort. And so that's what we want to work on to do this, to, evaluate, to try to get the prevalence, an idea about the prevalence of the disease among the Alaska Native. And it would be really great to uh, collaborate with, uh, with, uh, with other areas in American India to see how the impact of this disease in, the, in this population. And we would like to also see how much NASH there is in the population. It's really hard, but now, without the liver biopsy, but now that we have fibro, fibro scan, make it non-invasive, easy to check, that will give us a good idea and good data to evaluate. And that will be helpful to compare Alaska Native American Indian to other populations, because we have it with other ethnicity, we have good idea. And also as a good start, we'd like to look at those two genes, and, and maybe there will be more genes uh, coming down the pipeline to, to have relation to the disease. We'd like to evaluate that. And then, as I said, now that we have CAP, we can evaluate the fat amount um, maybe we can predict with this much fat, you can predict this much outcome. And maybe we can come to a conclusion if you have only this amount of fat, it is metabolically neutral, it's not going to worsen overall metabolic syndrome, so you don't have to worry about your liver. So all these information, which used to be gathered only through academic fancy machines, now we might be able to get it through a prospective long-term study, and um, uh, I know that we are having some studies for the microbiome in the colon cancer. We might be able to also study the microbiome among the patients with NASH to see if we have a certain pattern that might predict NASH, even less invasive. Uh, and then uh, the uh, risk, uh, the hepatocellular ca cancer. And if we can come up with a conclusion to uh, Alaska Native population that we can make a protocol to put those patients in surveillance versus just wait for them to show up with a liver cancer test today. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, made sense and I'm happy to answer any questions.